morning, church. Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be out of Ephesians 4, 1 through, 1 through 3. As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worth, worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Good morning. You guys are going to be good morning out here in a minute. <laughs> it is great to be here. God is such a great God. We are so blessed to be here and be in his house, to be with his people, to share in our time of communion and song and prayer, and to hear another word from him. Uh, we are, we're just so blessed. And it's great to see everyone here today. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being with us and making us a part of your Lord's Day. Uh, we hope that you feel welcome. And uh, if you have any questions for us, would you please let us know? You can catch me at the door or one of the, our elders. Uh, will our elders raise your hands so if our visitors especially can, can see you guys. Three of our four elders are here. One is homesick. Uh, actually, he's watching the Seahawks game. No, he's, he's not. He's he, he He's... He's sick. He actually is sick. But, uh, but you, you can see one of these three gentlemen, see myself. Uh, we'll be happy to talk with you, but we're just glad that you're here. And um, we've got um, a lot of good things are going on here and a lot of great plans that we have for the future. Uh, a lot of things are just, just pressing forward, and we're just very thankful. One of the greatest things uh, that's happened in the history of the Lord's Church happened again last week. And Tara Moore was baptized into the Lord. And we are so grateful. That is the best thing that can possibly happen in the Lord's church. Tara, where are you this morning? She's right here with her two daughters. If you haven't met Tara, you didn't get a chance to meet her last me week, please take a chance to meet her. It's so great to have you here. And we're, we're so thrilled for your decision that you've made. I have a card that was uh, sent to me. Um, from a very dear friend of mine and Susie's uh, that you have met. She's been here a couple of times. Her name is Angie. And Angie sends a note because we've had her daughter on our prayer list for quite some time now. Just a note to say thank you to my Puyallup family for your many prayers and continued concern for my daughter's health. So happy to tell you she is gaining strength every day. As we are reminded daily, God is so good. I look forward to worshiping with you all again soon in Christian love, Angie Sunday. And our sister, uh, Jared, I think, is going to be spending a few days with her next week. Uh, while she's making her rounds for the holidays, she's going to stop in and spend some time with Angie. But God is good. He answers prayer. And we're so grateful for his answered prayer. And in connection with that, uh, Crystal, who's been with us the last couple of weeks, glad to have her here, uh, has this uh, prayer of thanksgiving and also a prayer request for us. I'm thankful for this, to this, for this thanksgiving for God family, love, and everyone together. Please say a prayer for my father. He is ill and needs strength. Please pray for him and for God to wrap his arms around him and pray for me that I get through this. Thank you. Would you pray with me as, as we begin our lesson today? Father, you are truly a great and awesome God, and you are so good to us. We thank you, Father, for blessing us in so many ways, and we thank you for not only giving attention to our prayers but answering them. We thank you on behalf of Angie and her daughter that you have continued to bless them. We thank you, Father, that you have brought Tara our way and that you have covered her with your son, Jesus. We thank you for all that are present with us today, and we pray a special blessing upon each and every one of us. For those who are going to be traveling, Father, bless them. For those who are ill, we pray for healing. And for Crystal and her father, Father, we pray that you would bless them and give them comfort and peace. We pray for healing for her dad and for strength for her as she continues to uh, help him through his illness. Father, be with us as we open up your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that you would direct us, Father, and that you would help us to, to change and become more like your son with each passing day. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. We have been talking about unity in the body of Christ, and we are continuing in our study in Ephesians this morning. 
We'll take a break next week, and then we will finish our four-part series in two weeks from today. But at the end of chapter 3 last week, we, we looked at this verse, and I, and I want us to, to bear down on this verse for just a moment as, as we move forward this morning into another aspect of unity in the body of Christ. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is so good. And he can do exceedingly. He can do abundantly above all that we can ask or that we can even imagine. He can do these things. And therefore, he deserves glory in the church throughout all generations. Does that include our generation? He deserves glory in his church. And his people glorify God by doing exactly what Paul says in the next three verses. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God is never more glorified than when Christian brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. When we work together, when we encourage and build up one another, when we strengthen one another, when we reach out to a lost and dying world with the great news that they don't have to stay in the condition they are in. When we tell people that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you so that you could live not only an abundant life now, but an amazingly abundant life in the hereafter. God loves us, and he loves those who are not of us. And he wants us through our unity to demonstrate glory to God so that we can be the church so that we can reach those that he's called for us to reach. Now, when we consider unity, we have looked at these three verses at the beginning of chapter 4 for the last three weeks, and then we've moved on to other aspects here in this letter to the Ephesian church. We are dealing with a church 2,000 years ago who had some division, they were not unified like they needed to be. And I don't care where you go and what you do, no matter how uh, wonderful a group of Christians are, no matter how closely they're following the teachings of Christ, they all still have room to grow in unity. Everybody does. We all have an opportunity to strengthen in our time in our days, the body of Christ, so that the message of Jesus can go forward. Now, we want to talk about this mission this morning of unity. Being a member of the church is a calling. It is a vocation. It is not a part-time thing that we do. We are either God's people 24 hours a day, 168 hours in a week, 365 days a year, we are either God's people then or we're not God's people. It's a calling. And when we are changed by the love of God, when we put on Christ in baptism, there is a conversion that takes place. We no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to him. And therefore, our calling is to be like him. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, we, we always talk about Acts 2.38 and as well we should. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we leave off the next verse a lot of times. And the next verse is, is very important. And this promise is to you and to your children, 
The you there were the Jews that he was speaking to on the day of Pentecost. To your children, that would be the descendants of their children. To those afar off, those afar off in the New Testament describes Gentiles. So the promise of Acts 2.38 is for Jews, their prodigy, Gentiles, and the verse doesn't end there, as many as the Lord our God will call. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 tells us that we are called by the gospel. When we look into God's word, he calls us from the gospel. He calls us out of a world of darkness and into his marvelous light. He calls us to make a change in our lives. And so we have a calling as God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 and also in verse 9. A couple of interesting statements that Paul makes to the church here. Also, another church that didn't have it all figured out. You know, he's, he's trying to help them to be more like they needed to be. He addresses them in verse 2 to the church of God, which is at Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Verse 9, he says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Folks, we are called to be saints. Silence. <laughs> you know why there's silence? Because I don't think we really understand what that means. We are called to be saints. That means we are to be holy and set apart for service to our Lord. That's what it means to be a saint. It doesn't mean that 500 years after we die that somebody's going to look at something that we did and say, okay, maybe he or she was a saint. We're saints now. He's telling the, the Christians in Corinth they were saints then. We are saints now. We're called to be set apart for his service. And secondly, we are called, verse 9 says, into fellowship with Christ. We have a partnership with Jesus Christ in his mission. A partnership. We partake in his mission. His mission becomes our mission when we answer the call. And so in our scripture in chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul tells us that we are to bear with one another in love. We are called to bear with one another in love. When you bear with something, is that usually because everything's great? Or do you bear with something because there are sometimes some difficulties? That's, that, that refers to difficult times. We bear with one another in love. We bear with one another in love. Verse 3 says, We are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are called to unity in the body of Christ. We are called to be unified. We're called to be one. Different members with different roles in one body not pulling against each other, not going around behind each other, but working side by side with one another, with a common purpose, moving forward, sharing the love of Christ to a world that desperately needs that love. You don't have to look very far to see that. We live in difficult times. And just like Esther was called for such a time as this, we too have been called for such a time as this. God has placed us in his body in this time with the circumstances going on around about us because he is preparing us and has prepared us to answer what's happening in this world, to give glory to him, to provide an answer to those to come out of these difficulties that they are facing. And the only way we can do that is to be unified. And so we have to build up 
the body. We build it up. In Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, it says Christ is the head of the church, his body. So as we're talking about the body, we're talking about his church. Throughout the, the book of Ephesians, he uses those terms interchangeably. And so the building up of the body, which is, of course, that's us, not this building. Building up this body is important. What is the world trying to do to us individually as members of the body? To tear us down. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter who's standing in this pulpit. It doesn't matter who the elders are. It doesn't matter who the Bible class teachers are. A couple of hours a week when we gather together isn't going to make up for all the tearing down we get during the week from the world. We need each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to be involved in each other's lives. We have to spend time together in love. We need to share meals together. We need to share our lives together. We have to grow and build and strengthen one another up within the body. A little further in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, we began looking at these verses quite a few weeks ago while we were discussing leadership. And, of course, verse 11 says, And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And the purpose for that, verse 12 and following, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We build up the body into a perfect or full-grown man. And you know, let me tell you, that job is never done. You know why? Because the most mature among us who live certain life expectancies, they're going to be leaving us. And the little guys sitting up here with their Bibles, paying attention this morning, adults, you could probably learn from that. These guys need help growing up into the fullness and maturing. And guess what? Behind them, there are going to be others that come. And they're going to be babes in Christ as adults like Tara, who puts on Christ in baptism, that needs help being built up, being encouraged. There are, there are those of us that are different walks of life, and so the job never ends. We don't all of a sudden grow up and, okay, we're done. That's not how it works, because we're constantly growing, and we build each other up. I'm never so built up as I am when people come and they tell me, not nice sermon, Get a lot of that. I think that's just like the, the catchphrase. You have to say that to, in order to be able to escape the building, right? <laughs> but when they come and say, what you said this morning about this did this to me. That's when I'm built up. Because that means somebody got it. It means somebody got it. But I try to build you up, and you're trying to build me up, and guess what? We're both growing together. It's a beautiful thing the way God has designed it to be. To the measure of Christ. Folks, we're never going to get there. We have to constantly be striving to that measure of Christ. Constantly be changing. Constantly be reassessing ourselves to see where we are in comparison with Christ. And we're always going to fall short. But folks, I'm not the guy I was a month ago. I'm not the one I was a year ago, or 10 years ago, or 40 years ago. 
And hopefully next week I won't be the guy I was this week or last month, next month, next year. I'm constantly growing. We together need to be doing that. Speaking the truth in love, verse 15 says. Folks, we have a responsibility to speak the truth in love to people, to encourage them by the word of God to address their lives and to change. And when we're not unified, we can't help people do that. We can't. Because when we're tearing at each other, we're not focused on the people out there that need the word of God. And let me tell you, if, if it's tumultuous within the body, do we really want to bring somebody into that body so that they experience such a thing as that? God forbid that we do that. Each part serving or functioning, each part doing its share, verse 16 says. We all have a role to play. We all have a role to play. I don't know how many of you have been to county fairs and those kinds of things where they've had uh, uh, pulling events. And they still do in some place. Well, in Columbia, Tennessee, they have Mule Day. And, and we chuckle. And I chuckled when I got there when people told me about Mule Day. Folks, there's 300,000 people that come for Mule Day, and it lasts. It's not a day, it's a week. I mean, there's a parade of mules, and the highway patrol has to shut down the roads so they can bring the mules in. It's a big thing that's been going on for over 100 years. They might not even realize why they do it anymore. I don't know. But one of the things they do is they do mule pulls to see which mule is the strongest. See who has the strongest mule. And they have a sled behind them, and they put weight on it. And they have to pull it a certain distance. And you know what they do? They'll take the two strongest mules and they'll hook them together. And they can usually pull twice as much together as they ever could separately. You take both of the weight that they pulled separately and you put it together and then you add to it that same amount of weight and they can pull it because they're pulling together. When we're pulling together, we can pull a greater weight than we can ever pull when we're, we're not pulling together. It's fascinating how God has designed this world that we live in. And for the work of ministering, and here I want to talk to you for just a moment about ministering. This, this word ministering refers to service. Service. We are all servants of God through Christ Jesus. We're servants. You think, well, you know, I can't do this. We should not focus on what we can't do. We need to focus on what we can do. If you're always focused on what you can't do, guess what you're always going to be doing? Nothing. Focus on what you can do. If all you can do is this much, then by all means do that. If all you can do is send a card, then in love, send a card. Do what you can do. The work of ministering. If we turn over to chapter 5 and 6 in our letter, we see that wives are to minister to their husbands. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their wives be to their husbands in everything. Folks, this is not a subservient position. This is working beside their husband. Tells husbands, you know, we get upset about, oh, we can't, we can't do that to our women. But we stop and we don't talk about what he says to the men. I think the men have a much higher calling than the women do in this section of Scripture. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Who has the higher calling? The husbands are called to lay down their lives for their wives. 
You want to minister to your wife? Give up your life for hers. And I don't mean necessarily stepping out in front of a bus, but, you know, you, you've got to, to live your life for that person. If it means giving your life physically for your wife, then by all means do it. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You know, when you get down here to verse 33, um, for the sake of time, I want us to, to work our way down there. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Folks, if we're ministering in our marriages, our marriages will be stronger. If we're serving our spouse the way God has called for us to serve. It doesn't just have to do with waiting on the Lord's table or leading singing in the body of Christ in order to be a servant. There are 168 hours in a week, and we're called into a vocation. Children, you have a role to play in ministering to your parents. They're still paying attention, by the way, over here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. What's the age restriction on that, folks? There is not one. When you're 18, you don't get to say, okay, I'm done. My dad's almost 80 and my mom's almost 77 years old. And I still try to offer them, I, I probably offer them a lot better respect than I did when I was a teenager. I'm still respecting them. Because if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be where I am today. For better or for worse, God gave me them as parents. You don't get to choose your parents, folks. Not a one of us got to put in an order with God and say, this is what I'd like on my list for my parents. God puts you with those parents for a reason. In regardless of their health, regardless of whether or not they're the greatest dad in the world or not, or the greatest mom in the world or not, you are to honor and love and respect your parents. Serve them. And if you have parents that are not Christians, serving them in Christian love, who knows, may bring them into a relationship with Christ. I baptized a Iwo Jima vet in 2008. He was 83 years old. He was coming to church with his daughter. And he had never put on Christ in baptism. Parents, you are to minister to your children. And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. I want to commend every parent that's here today that's children are here. God bless you. God bless you for thinking enough of your children to bring them into worship today. Thank you for doing that. That's the, the greatest service you can do is bring your children up with an appreciation and a love for God. Because you think things are bad out in society? Let's go a whole generation and not teach our children who God is and let's see what it looks like. And lastly, he talks about servants and masters. Again, this is more of an economic situation than it is an oppressive situation. Though oppression was a part of uh, the slavery master issue during that time, a lot of times it had nothing to do with that. It was purely economic because there were no jobs. And listen to what he says. So, so think about this towards your employees or your employer. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. 
How is it that, that employees are to treat their employers as if they were working for Jesus himself? Yeah, but you don't know what my boss is like. It doesn't give you an out. There's no out. It doesn't say only if your master treats you a certain way. We are to be salt and light in the world. And the only way we can do that is to treat others the way we are supposed to treat. Verse 9, and you masters, do the same thing to them. Give up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Masters, go back to verse 6, just like servants. Don't do it with eye service. If you have people who work for you or you supervise people on your job, you treat them as if you're doing that for Jesus Christ. We want to change the world? That's how you change the world. That's how you change the world, and you're going to change the world one person at a time by doing that. And that person may change another person who may change another person, and we never know where that ends. We never know where that ends. And so at the beginning of chapter 5, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Folks, we need to be imitators of God. When people see us, they need to see someone doing their best to be what God would be if he were walking in front of them right now. They need to see us as Jesus would be if Jesus were dealing with that person right now. I'm going to tell you something. I went, before I made my long trip, my drive here a couple of weeks ago, uh, I went and uh, transferred my tags from one vehicle to another so I could have tags to drive back on. I wasn't interested in meeting every state trooper between here and Alabama. Um, that was just not a part of my schedule. So I had to have tags. And I go in early in the morning at South Meridian location uh, of DOL. And there's a guy up there at the counter. He doesn't have anything that he needs. And the girl is just following the list. We need a photo ID. We need, you know, whatever. And he's like, well, well, I called and they said I didn't need those things. Well, obviously you do because you can go to their website and everywhere else and you can see what you, what you need. And he becomes belligerent. And this guy's probably 30 or 35 years old. And he becomes belligerent with this girl behind the counter. It's the first person she's seen. And he starts shouting obscenities and curse words at her. And heads out the door. And you could just see her countenance just fall. And there was a lady who was in front of me, and she got called to the other counter. And I was sitting there the whole time, and I was praying. I said, God, send me that counter. And he did. And I went over there, and she says, can I help you? And she just kind of looks up, you know. And I said, I'm really sorry about that guy and what he said to you. I said, that wasn't right. She said, it's okay. And I said, it's not okay. It's not okay for anybody to treat somebody like that. And I'm really sorry. And she started to smile. You can make a difference one person at a time. You can bring light into somebody's life. But folks, we need to be united. We need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace with God's people because that's where it all extends out from. It extends out from us. The mission of the church is not to go to church. The mission of the church is to go as the church wherever we go. We go as the church. We are representatives of Christ wherever we go in this world. That is the mission of the body of Christ. I just want to tell you, I love you all. And I'm so glad to be here. God has blessed me and my family tremendously in the 11 months that we've been here. And we are so thankful to be here with you. And so thankful to see the wonderful things 
that God is, is working and doing among the body here in Puyallup. And there's a lot of work to do. As long as the Lord extends our days, there's work for us to do. Let's work together. Let's love each other. Let's love the Lord. And, and let's, let's set this world on fire for Jesus Christ. That's what he's called for us to do. We are called. This morning, you may be here as a Christian, and maybe you haven't been living up to your calling. Maybe you've got some shortcomings, some difficulties, keeping you from serving the way that you need to serve. Maybe you've allowed the world to put a roadblock between you and, and doing what you need to do. Remove that roadblock today. Oh, maybe you can't do it, but we can sure help you. We need to get plugged into the power that can remove that roadblock. We need to pray with you, pray for you, and engage God in that situation so those things can be corrected in your life. If sin has come in, let's take care of that. Discouragement, let's take care of that. We're going to be singing a song here in just a moment. And during that song, if you have a need as a member of the body of Christ, let us help you. Please come forward. But if you're here today and you're not a member of the body of Christ, you've never named the name of Jesus, I encourage you this day to consider who he is and what he's done for you. Jesus went to the cross. He died for your sins. We talked about it a few moments ago as, as Chris reviewed uh, what we were talking about with the bread and the cup and the body and the blood of Christ. Jesus dying for you. While he's on that cross, he's thinking about you and desiring for you to come into a relationship with him. Believe in him as the son of God. As our sweet sister Tara did last week, be willing to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of the sins in your life. Turn away from those things. Turn to the cross of Jesus. Be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. That is baptized. Rising up, a new creature, a new creation, covered by the blood of Jesus to walk in newness of life. Can we help you with that today? We invite you to come also during this song we're about to sing. Whatever your need is this morning, please make it known to us as together we stand and as we sing.